Oh yes, this is the Hardcore Marketing Show. I'm Casey Cheshire, your host for this epic journey. Today's show is sponsored by Ringmaster on a mission to launch B2B podcasts that create relationships, generate revenue, and drive growth. Ringmasterlive.com. Bam. And here we go. Ah, uh, we're cracking into another episode of the Hardcore Marketing Show. I'm really excited about this one. This is an episode that has been trying to happen for years, for years, for decades. I've been informed it's our third attempt. And third so we're, we're, we hit record so that the power doesn't go out. I can't wait to introduce you to the guest today. He is an absolute badass. He is a marketing leader, a business operator, a brand marketing and content marketing thought leader, author of digital, of digital photography hacked. He's a public speaker. He speaks Japanese. He's got so many awards. I can't even read them all off because, well, PR week and all these other, there's just so many, he's an award-winning leader, fractional CMO, fractional CCO, brand consultant to the stars at Jeremy Wolf Consulting. Who is it? Jeremy Wolf himself. Welcome to the show, sir. It is, it is great to be here. I keep looking for who it is you're talking about because surely that's not me. Surely not. Seriously, you've been busy, huh? Oh, you know, I've lived a life. Uh, yeah. yeah. And none of those awards were on my, my screen until we talked uh, the first time. So you, in the last 90 days. There you go. That. There's one. There's one right there. Love it. You just got the awards littered about. <laughs> the award. Littered about. Right? <laughs> Well, hey, man, I got to I gotta pick this thing up and hand it to you. Cool. So one second, it's heavy. Hang on. I'm ready. Oh, God. I got to work out more, man. I got to get back to the gym. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, oh, One-handed. Nice. Look at that. Got You got it? Okay. I got it. I got it. I got it. All right. Take Thor's hammer. Smash for me some kind of marketing myth, bogus strategy, misconception. Set the record straight once and for all. You know, I must be worthy because I'm picking up Molnir. And, yes. that, you know, that is that is the best thing that's happened to me all day. You know, there's a myth. And here we go. And this might sound counterintuitive, or I might be doing myself out of business, but so be it. Uh, the myth is that early stage companies don't need to invest in complicated branding. And that might sound, you know, what? You're, Casey just told the world that I'm this branding person. And I, I you know, I would, I would love to take money, but I'm not going to take anyone's money when it's not going to be helpful. And so many companies spend too much money on the brand really before they figured out exactly what their, their product or service is. You know, pre-MVP companies are spending a huge amount of money on logos and websites and messaging hierarchies and all this sort of stuff. But the reality is if they haven't actually established a product or service and gone some way to working out some type of product market fit, they're going to be flip-flopping and doing that branding again in six months time and 12 months time and so on. So, so my myth and that I just will hammer down with Molnir is oh, that companies are spending way too much money too early. Get yourself a one-page website, get yourself a logo you like, and come up with a name that you're comfortable with. That is where you start. And then get some customers under the board, talk to those customers, and then have a conversation with me. But don't do it. Don't do it too early because you're just going to throw your money away and you should spend it on your product. There you go. Myth smashed. Boom. I love Boom. this. And you know what? This reminds me of this thing that drives me crazy, which is this knee jerk reaction of marketers. Mm -hmm. And I'm probably guilty of this. So if you're feeling guilty, listening to this, feel guilty and stop doing it. Redesigning the website is like a first step. So many times new marketer comes in mm -hmm. and they got to redesign the website or the CEO wants them to redesign the website. And mm -hmm. we just, so much cycles on this. And I loved how you, you talked about when you do this, you're going to be flipping, you're going to be flopping, you're going to be mm -hmm. going all over the place. But I, the thought that came to mind was one of those Scottish games where you have a big log. You're not mm -hmm. flipping a card. You just spent all three months, a half a year of doing this website. You're going to have to flip this other heavy thing. So it's like heavy flips. It's going to take all your time and energy, man. I love you're highlighting this. Why do we fall into this trap? Where does this come from? I think it's it's uh, companies or, or individuals that perhaps ha I think they're further along the path than they really are. So they, they have this perception that we're the only thing missing, the only thing that's going to get all these customers in the door is a complicated website and pages about features and all this sort of stuff. And that's, that's really not the truth, especially if you haven't figured out. And again, I talked about going on the pathway to product market fit. 
Because the reality is you have to have happy customers and lots of them before you can really establish that. But yeah, it's, it's people thinking this is the thing that's going to crack the code and get everybody in. And that's not the, that's not the truth. What's going to get people in is word, at this stage, word of mouth and customers who are willing to come in knowing your early stage and trial your product or service, get used to it, give you honest feedback, and then help you build something. And then once you've got that base of people, and once you're pretty sure you've got features that differentiate your product or service, which is a whole other conversation, then, then let's have a conversation about what your brand represents and who it's for. Because the reality is, like I said, you might even change your audience. I worked for a company, they changed their target audience four times in two years. Jeez. You know, and he, I mean, that was, you know, we were doing lots of work on the website, but quite frankly, that really wasn't the problem. The, the problem was we didn't know who we were trying to sell to. And we kept on trying to reestablish that through branding. And the reality is our customers were coming in. Yes, they were coming in through the organic reach we'd established and through some pay-per-click ads and that sort of thing. But they were staying because of the product we'd been building. And that's the thing we need to spend money on, not constantly reinventing our, our visual identity and the language we use on our website. So there you go. Mis okay, smashed. so I love this. I want to dive in. Didn't yep. know who we were trying to sell to. And then you said... That's where you should spend the money. Where should we spend the money when we're trying to get product market fit? On product, oh uh, no no well okay, product market fit is something you have post customers. So we need to have customers on customers and, on and customers in in the platform. Yeah, we need to have conversations with them. If you're on the pathway to doing that, I would spend money on things like research, paid research. Uh, if you have to pay them, so be it. And often early stage customers companies do because you know that's what takes people to get in the conversation. What about uh, doing use, a podcast with these customers in this early stage? I, you know, I'm a great fan of podcasting and uh, I'm on a podcast now. So I have to say <laughs> podcasting so meta, is right? a really, really good idea. Um, early stage, you know what? I wouldn't necessarily invest in building a podcast. I would mm. want to be on a podcast. I'd use that as a piece, like any piece of content as a way of drawing attention to your product or service. But if you're trying to, to build that loyalty, especially, I know I typically work in B2B technology, so often it's relatively yeah. geeky tech. Um, it's not a mass audience we're trying to reach. It's right. often quite a discreet audience. So yeah, if, if I was a guest on a podcast, like I happen to be right now, sure. I would want to promote that through the right channels. Uh, and then obviously in time, once my brand was built up, but building up your own podcast is a, is a great way of having that more intimate conversation with your audience. So absolutely. Do Early that research, of, you know, ask them questions. Yeah. Absolutely. Ask them questions. Create your little focus groups. I mean, there are a whole bunch of websites. There's Winter and those types of companies where you can get market research on everything from your UX and UI through to your, your brand messaging. I mean, that's a great way to get that specific feedback. And then obviously your own customers, people who have, have given off their time to be inside your platform. Yeah. Uh, get them around the table. If, if you're in the same city, go out and buy them beer and give them pizza. You know, there are, there are a bunch of different ways to get that feedback. Now, the, the caveat, and here, here's a little caveat, um, and this is a tough one because you're getting feedback, but don't, don't let the last piece of feedback be the thing that shapes your product or service. And I know it's really, I mean, again, if you poured your heart that's and so soul hard, into right? a product or platform, you, get, you hear something negative or positive, you go, ha, that's the secret code. That's what we need to do. <laughs> so the reality is that's one person's opinion. If you start to get some type of momentum, you get more and more people providing that. Yeah, okay, that's that's the time. Or, or indeed, that individual is someone from, let's say, an analyst house like Gartner or somebody like that. You know, that they that's feedback that you can typically take to the bank. But but the last customer who came on board says, "I don't like the color blue." That's not necessarily the reason to make everything green. So I would look at getting as many people as you can around that pizza, around that beer and get some collective feedback and use that to guide but for goodness sake don't suddenly go you know we need to change tomorrow because i just heard this negative feedback on a, on our discourse or through our social media that that is absolutely the worst thing to do and unfortunately i've been with companies that have made that and it's it's sad because the reality is the core of their business is something that's evolving but it's going to take input from many people to evolve properly so yeah i mean again that i i think talk to your people Talk to as many people as you can uh, and evolve. But also back yourself, back the fact that you had this creative idea that was born of know, an apple falling from a tree or whatever it was that, that built this thing uh, and, and see that through as far as you can before you suddenly go, I had a client like this who went from software development to macadamia nut farming in Hawaii. 
Um, and you know what? <laughs> that was the right thing for them at that time. Um, but don't don't make the macadamia farm a leap. You know, that that's not not necessarily something you want to do, at least until you've tried every possible option. You know, I don't know if I've had those. I think I've seen cookies that have those in them. I don't mm. know if I've had macadamia nut before. You've not been to Hawaii. Okay. It's, it's chocolate-covered macadamia nuts, the big thing in Hawaii. I've been to Hawaii, but really? I clearly missed out on the one thing I should have tried there. You Is know that what? right? I, I'm more of an almond guy, but yeah. okay, to, to each their own. And again, I have nothing against macadamia nuts, nor the people who farm them. <laughs> you heard it here. Official statement. Yes, indeed. Uh, yes, indeed. I, I, I approve this message. <laughs> yes, indeed. You can put that on your poster. Um, that, that is free to the world of, of almond and macadamia nut farmers. Now, here's but, yeah. a quick, quick side question. Do you sure, think sure. that almond has been overplayed? You know, I'm a fan of superfoods, and the almond is, is certainly on rotation. Um, I like a blueberry. I like an avocado. Um, but no, I don't think it's overplayed. I know people in California have got issues and there's watering <laughs> and all those sorts of things. No Let's water, not go there. for one. <laughs> there is that. Right. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> were we talking about marketing? We've yeah, we were. To food. <laughs> but, okay, so I wanted to go back to this. I, I yep. drew a circle as more of a rectangular box around this thing. Don't mm -hmm. let the last bit of feedback decide your strategy moving forward. Mm -hmm. I've done that. I do that all the time. I try not to. Mm -hmm. How do I ward against that? I would, and I'm a great believer in one page plans, you know, mm -hmm. and anything more than I used to work for very large enterprises where you, you'd have a 60 page PowerPoint and it would have every single, I don't know, like the dictionary had vomited on it. Um, but I'm a great believer in one page plans and you need to find junctures to sit down away from your desk or away from your zoom or whatever it is and work out exactly what your business represents and stands for. Uh, and it, you may, it may just be as simple as a value proposition because maybe you haven't figured out organizationally, you haven't got a, a full on business plan. A lot of companies weirdly don't, but at least have some, some sense of direction and values and yeah. some supporting milestones. And if, if you find yourself, I don't know, put it in a drawer, put it in a virtual drawer, whatever people do these days. But if you find yourself wandering, I would open up that drawer, a virtual drawer and look at that plan and go, okay, well, that's what I thought we were going to do. Mm. And now we're over here. And it's not to say though those, again, it's not to say the apple hasn't fallen from the tree and create a new direction. And I'll mix some more metaphors in there if I can. But it's not as if you can't pivot because companies successfully pivot. Um, but I would go back to that plan because you wrote that for a reason. You know, you wrote that for a very, very valid reason. And I would make sure that you've, you've explored that concept and idea to, to, its, to its end before you right. suddenly go, we're now going down a different path. Uh, and I'm, I was the same. I was doing some business planning yesterday with a friend of mine. And we were, I, I was started to get into the, the world of organizational planning. Well, what's my goal and objective? And I thought, no, no, actually, yeah. I haven't actually figured out what this concept is. So I went back to a value prop. I said, okay, well, what is it that I'm trying to represent? Who am I representing it to? What differentiates my product or service? And how does it meet the needs of this audience I've identified? Do that. Do that as a minimum before you start suddenly, I don't know, spiraling off in a different direction. So yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm a great fan of the one-page plan and using that as something of a touchstone before you start to go somewhere else. And it requires you to step away from rowing or step away from mm -hmm. hitting the hammer and mm -hmm. there's something attractive about hitting the hammer and rowing and doing the the tactical working in the business not on it that is is hard to step away sometimes to do that one page plan mm -hmm. or to look at it yeah yeah I, I know and it's especially for smaller companies and I, I work with a lot of earlier stage startups and, and I work with a lot of founders uh, who are taking the customer support calls and who are making the coffee and who are doing the sales and doing, doing everything, uh, getting out of your environment. And that's, that's mm -hmm. hard when, we, I don't know, when we're living at work these days, it's, right. it's hard to get out of, out of your environment. But I, I would, again, it's, it's, a, it's cliched, but oh, I go for a walk around the block, take the dog out, you know, find, find something that separates you from that day to day and, and give yourself some thinking time. And again, yeah. I was uh, so my friend I mentioned yesterday, we, we were, I guess, both at a point where we needed to, to jar ourselves out. And she suggested we get on a phone uh, or a Zoom as it is. Phone, what's a phone? And we, we look at, <laughs> uh, no, we, we, we block out an hour and mm -hmm. we switch off email and we set ourselves a goal and we set ourselves a timer in 25 minutes and we see how far we can get towards our goal. And it was a really refreshing exercise. 
because it was separation. It was it allowed me to work on this this value prop that I was talking about without the distraction of I don't know Slack and and messaging and email and my unconscious brain. It allowed me to focus. So yeah, I, I'm find find a way or find an individual who can help get you out of that mind space. Yeah, who can ask you questions in a I don't know journalistic way that helps guide your thinking. Uh, Challenge and thinking. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's where advisors and mentors can be absolutely critical because they will they will offer a counter proposition, and they're not doing it from a place of love. They're doing it from yeah. a place of that this is the genuine learned experience and advice that you need to hear. So yeah, I mean, again, find yourself a way, find a way of stepping outside yourself if if you're able to. And it's crazy, but there are enough hours in the day to do it. You know, you can always find time. It's like training. You can always find if you want to commit to being trained in something, you can find time to do it. You know, there's always, always a way to get rid of the busy work and focus on the things that are important. And sometimes you just need to take a step back to figure out what's important too. I mean, this Absolutely, is, what's yeah. great is like, this is a life conversation, but it's also a marketing conversation. It ties into strategy. If you're, if you're so wrapped up in the email inbox, you're not planning what is, you don't even know what's important. You can't make Absolutely. that Absolutely. Well, I mean, that's a good point on the email inbox because I, I used to rail against it. I mean, back in the day, I was sort of Stephen Covey, seven habits of highly effective people and all that sort of stuff. I had a whole series of different ways of, of managing information. And I was, I rail, I was a great fan of the zero inbox theory. You know, I, I love yeah. that idea. Great, great idea. But then I realized my inbox actually is my process. And it sounds mm -hmm. stupid, but I, I, I can actually, if something comes in, I, I have a great belief in handling each one piece of paper or one piece of information only once, which is a Stephen Covey thing. Uh, but I might look at my inbox. I'll do it in the morning. I'll star things that are important. I'll delete things that aren't. And that'll be a way of managing information. So I guess instead of trying to fight it, I've embraced this way of communicating. Um, unfortunately, along comes Slack and messaging and everything else, which kind of throws a spanner in the works. But I think there are absolutely ways to use the technology that has become our default uh, as a way of guiding your process in your day, but don't, don't be owned by it. Don't, don't let it dominate to a point where that last piece of information, like the earlier conversation, that last piece of information you receive becomes the most important thing. It, last it just email you receive becomes the most important email you have, which is not yeah. true. No, no, it's just, it's the most immediate. Yeah. And that, that's one reason why, to be honest, I find Slack and messaging to be, um, while it can be a useful conversational tool, it's a distraction, it's interruption. Uh, yes. and, and it assumes that and demands an immediate response. And I think that's one thing that you have to manage because it's the same, same conversation about the CEO who reacts to the last information they got. Just because someone happened to use that moment in time to type a message in Slack, nothing wrong with Slack. It's a great product, great platform. Microsoft Teams, also a good platform. There you go. But it's, it's, <laughs> it's um, the, just because someone happened to send something at that time, if you set a habit, which is I will immediately respond just because it happened in that instant, what happened to the thought you were having? What happened to the work you yeah. were doing? What happened to the creative process that you were going through? So yeah, it's yeah, it's it sounds so obvious, but I think we we become a victims. We become victims of the communications channels that are supposed to empower us and supposed to help make life better. We've in fact become um, they become digital albatrosses around our neck. There you go. Digital albatrosses. Digital albatrosses. Did you know this morning when you woke up that you were going to be saying digital albatross later on? That yes, day? actually, I have a post-it note right here that says, say digital albatross to Casey. <laughs> it's a thought you had this morning. Dear God, I know exactly what to, to, to say. And Absolutely. We, don't worry, we won't name the episode that. <laughs> no, I, actually, I should buy the domain name now. Digitalalbatross.com. That must be. You should. You should. I should. Jeremy I should. Wolf, Digital Albatross. <laughs> there you go. I, I could sell nothing with that right, nothing right. <laughs> but maybe you're like there's someone on your team that all you have to do is get rid of them and then your company will grow mm, this is true this is very interesting, very interesting. The, the <laughs> weirdest question things happen on these podcasts man Embrace this is so it. good though the idea of challenging the thought that just because the message happened the email happened the text mm -hmm. the strategy the feedback the customer just because it doesn't mean you need a filter, right? Or something to say, okay, is this a now thing? Is this important? Is it urgent? Yeah. And that comes back, I think, to that, that one page plan idea or often it's, and, and again, I spend time, a lot of time in branding. Uh, it's often being the keeper of that stuff we agreed to. 
you know, when it comes to brand, often I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm writing a, a website now for a conversational AI company and, uh, cool. it, yeah, it's amazing technology. It's like you go to drive through McDonald's and the, the machine does everything and understands it's, it's very, very cool stuff. But yeah, I mean, I, I've become as, as an outside contractor, I've kind of been the keep, become the keeper of the brand. So this is, a, you know, what websites are a long process. But I'm, I've become the person who goes, well, actually, you know, back, back, in, back in May, this is what we agreed to in terms of the brand. And I, I'm, I'm the one who raises that flag because oftentimes I know somebody in sales might, hey, hey, this is a great idea. Yeah. Let's do that. And I go, well, sure, we can entertain that. But remember that thing we did back then. Uh, and that's important, especially on a long-term project like a, like a web because, you know, you're ending up, um, you can't end up with, a, with a, a website that doesn't look anything like the one you started with. You yeah. Know? That, that's dangerous. So, yeah, let's have a conversation. It's great. I mean, again, a uh, similar topic. I, I'm sometimes asked to do, like, I don't know, a company will want to, uh, the rebranding, for example. Okay. Uh, and I will always ask them, have you built out your brand fundamentals, your mission, vision, values, uh, your purpose, your core brand and product messaging? And uh, you worked out an archetype, worked out your persona. Well, I mean, again, these are basic. These are fundamentals of brand. And yeah. if they say no, I will often turn down the job unless they're willing to do that. Because otherwise, they're asking me to solve problems that are fundamental to their brand at the point of writing copy. And that, that's not the time you want to figure out what you, who you are and what you represent. You know, that's the time you want to bring it to life. And so I'm, I'm a great believer. And again, it goes back to that, oh, that one page plan that I keep going on about, but it's, yeah. What, what is that stuff that we agreed to back then? How do we bring it to life here? As opposed to, we need to I know, write it, write a one page feature on this thing. Okay. But I'm, I'm, you also want me not just to tell a story, but figure out what your story is. And those in my mind are different actions. So yeah, mm. be, be again, in my world, be the champion of that brand and those fundamentals and the skill is bringing them to life. But unless you're willing to make that investment, it's really, really hard. And quite frankly, often counterproductive because you end up with people arguing about brand fundamentals in the comment section on your Google Doc. And that's, that's not the conversation you want to have. You know? Right. We want to talk so how about do you avoid features that? and How benefits. do you avoid that later conversation? You, you, make, you put people through an exercise to look at their brand core. So what is our mission, vision, values, purpose? Okay. And if you haven't built those, there are tools and workshops and things that I can do and that will help you help bring those to life. Uh, they, will, they will become, and then obviously messaging, product messaging, which is really about features and benefits for an audience, um, thought leadership messaging. I mean, those types of things, get those, work out your one page, put them to one side, and then let's have a conversation about what your yeah. website is and what it represents. If you don't do that, it's going to look like everybody else's, <laughs> you know, that's, and that's, that's also one of the great challenges, especially for early stage companies that are inspired by much larger companies. They say, we want to look like them. And you go, well, I can make you something that looks like them, but is that your company? And oftentimes it's not, it's an aspiration, but your company needs to stand for something that represents who you are. And it's really easy to go, yeah, okay, Salesforce is a market leader. Let's make it look like Salesforce. Sure, but can you do what Salesforce does? Not really. So, yeah, again, I, I always go back to what is the core? What is the heart of your brand? And then let's bring that to life. I don't remember what your question was, Casey, but I'm sure I, I'm sure I kind of answered it there. Yeah, it's fucking fantastic, man. Excellent. I'm happy now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm running out of space. I'm, I'm already, I've turned my, my note page into three columns uh, just to be able to keep track. The, the quote that you mentioned that mm -hmm. sometimes comes up, we want to look like them. Mm -hmm. Gosh, isn't this just the root of all misformed tactics where it, mm -hmm. it's not related? And you, you mentioned, you know, go back to the core, know who you are as a company before mm -hmm. it because you, you may not be that other company. It makes total sense, but wanting to just look like them is disingenuous and it, it'll probably fall flat because it'll read flat. It'll, it'll read like you're pretending, right? It's like yep. a business dinner or a date or something where you're being someone you're not eventually. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're not in the CIA. You're not an agent. Those things are going to fall away and people are going to know who you are. That's a good point. I, I, you do see companies, and I remember I used to work in sales for a, a marketing agency, and you'd see companies that would I don't know, send us an RFP or something, and it would say, it, the company would look like a CIA front. It would look like it would be the most generic, we are reliable, scalable, robust, nimble, blah, 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 blah. LLC. Yeah, and it was like, yeah. 
I, I, I don't know. I, I have no idea what this company actually is or does. It's just lots of nonsense words. And then again, I, I would partly, again, I, I doubt it was the CIA front. It's often the victim of bad marketing where marketers who use words like reliable, scalable, robust, nimble, end-to-end -end solution, blah, 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 those terrible non-words, especially in, in technology. It's often people who don't understand what it is that they're trying to represent and who they're trying to sell it to or promote it to. And right. so you, you cover your lack of understanding with nonsense words. Uh, and it's, again, it's, it's not good SEO. I don't remember the last time I typed, I want a reliable, scalable, robust, nimble something into a search engine. Uh, but it also shows, uh, a, again, a, a, a lack of differentiation and a lack of understanding of who you're trying to reach. And so, yeah, again, yeah, we've all seen those sites. And again, I, I still come back to that core. What is it that your brand represents? And if you don't know that, then all you've got, quite frankly, especially in, in B2B SaaS, where I spend a bunch of time as well, all you have is probably a really interesting idea potentially. And you may have a framework or something that can execute, but you haven't figured out who it's for or why it's different. And if you can't answer those questions, you're going to be one of those startups that unfortunately falls by the wayside. Why it's different. It, hmm. This reminds me of this concept. I'd love to get your take on this, mm -hmm. is the idea of deciding to be something which excludes something else. And I think a lot of us can try to be something like everything. Like we, we, oh, we're that and we're this and we're that. And we're not excluding any customers. We're not excluding any services or, or it, we're just trying to be everything to everyone. I guess that's the mm -hmm. phrase. Talk to me about how, I mean, how do you, it takes a little bit of courage, I think, to, mm -hmm. to say, no, nope, this is what we stand for. Yeah. And this is what we do. And we're not like that. So we can't look like them because we, we're not that. And how do you come to grips with that? How do you, how do you talk your companies and your clients into doing that? Well, I mean, my, my background's in PR. And so okay. PR, I've always felt was a narrow conversation. And you always had to, you had to really think about the individual you were talking to. And, and that often was, I don't know, it was a journalist who was a conduit to a, a buyer, a CTO or CMO or COO or something. Uh, and the closer you are to understanding that individual, their needs and their wants and, you know, the classic persona stuff, the easier it is to come up with some type of differentiation. Now, if you're trying to say we are everything to everybody, a couple of things are going to happen. One is your, your marketing spend is going to be so spread out and so narrow that you're really not going to reach anybody. And the second thing is you're going to have a real problem differentiating your product against those pure play companies. Because you're not going to be able to say, yes, we can be the know, accountant's best friend and we can be the architect's best friend and we, we can be the um, doctor's best friend. The reality is you can't be all those things. Uh, and the third area is in terms of your thought leadership, which is often going to drive top of funnel conversation. Um, a small company is not going to be able to create a, a valid thought leadership proposition across all of those industry verticals. You're not going to be able yeah. to do it. In the future, you might be able to be all those people's best friends and solve all their problems. But when you're starting out, let's make it a narrow conversation. Get really good at that one thing to a point of establishing genuine differentiation and then see how you can look at um, I don't know, parallel industries. But yeah, you can't be everything to everybody unless it's an absolutely pure, I don't know, let's say it's a data tool and it's I don't know, something that makes Excel prettier or whatever it might be there we go there's yeah. a business idea for you something that makes excel prettier um and it's something Skins where, for excel <laughs> yeah why not why not but it's Flowers something that, and... that that sits on top of something that has is a genuine market leader and it yeah. doesn't matter it doesn't matter that it is a, there's no va there's no necessarily value necess necessary value in it it being tailored for various industries it just sits there um right. and that's fine but most that gets commoditized are... quickly then too if it's yeah. just ubiqu ubiquitous like that yeah, but at least that's a way of saying, okay, we can be everything to everybody because we sit on top of this thing that is a standard and you yeah. pay us 15 bucks a month and the thing happens. And that's right. great. There are companies that do that really, really well. But right. for most of the companies I work with, they've got a more complex proposition and you have to get, you have to go narrow. You have to go narrow before you can go wide. And they, again, need to figure out who they're selling to and what the, what the value is that that person derives from the, the product or platform. And once you've established that, yeah, okay, let's prove it in the real world. Let's establish that, that product market fit that we talked about before. Uh, let's own that. And then let's think about doing something else uh, or right. think about it again. Uh, and then when we're doing something else, let's look at the parallel one. I was talking to a client yesterday and he does uh, voice over IP telephony for healthcare. And it's a really good platform. And I was saying, well, what, you've, you've 
doing really well in healthcare. What about other industries? And he said, yeah, that's absolutely in the future, but let's, let's be really good at healthcare first. And then we were talking about, I don't know, legal, because they've got a very secure platform. So, okay, there's the legal fraternity, which also needs um, security. Okay, that would make a good next step. But let's, let's get this one down. And I, I really respect that response. Because some companies might go, hey, let's reskin our website and make it legal this, or let's right. reskin it and make it, I don't know, the perfect thing for architects. And his response was, no, let's, let's get very good at the one thing we're doing now and the thing we've established a reputation for before we start to consider alternatives and, you know, respect. I respect that too. I think I, I'm a, I like this conversation because even though it's something where people might initially say, oh, yeah, of course, we know hmm. this. Yes, but applying it or actually doing it. Yes, I know I should keep my car, my car clean or I should hmm. you know, keep my inbox lower or something. Yes, but practically applying it is so important. You so, don't want to Google your way to success. You, know? yeah, tell me more you don't want that. to be in a situation where you've got a website where you've got 10 different verticals on it. All of them are quite frankly SEO bait. And then when you actually get a sales inquiry, you're going, oh, hell, we're, we're an accountancy platform now. What is an accountancy platform typed into Google? I mean, seriously, I mean, you don't want to be in that situation. Well, I, I guess because the, the concern is if I, we do pick a focus, mm -hmm. what if, what if they don't like it? What, what if there's only a few people that like it? What mm -hmm. if it doesn't work? I'd go back to my earlier conversation about not over investing in branding. Uh, you, you can, you, that's when, that's when you can think about a pivot. Make, make sure you, you've shaken every tree before you come yeah. to that conclusion. Because again, there must have been, I always ask founders a question, what was the inspiration? What was the thing that, that got you down this path? And that thing is often, you know, there, there are some really interesting stories. Um, explore it. I mean, again, work out. And, and if, if you genuinely work, figure out, hey, there is not an opportunity here, that's when you can pivot, you know? Yeah. As opposed to, again, over-investing in branding and creating this mighty representative empire around this one thing and then discovering that thing isn't actually working. So yeah, I, I would, yeah, I'd do that. I would uh, explore, shake trees, determine that, yeah, this isn't actually the right fit. And then that's when you look to pivot. Mike, mic drop. It's fantastic, man. We Who go. are you? Who are you? Take me Who back in I? time. Oh, okay. Jeremy Wolf. When you were growing well, up, did you know you're going to be brand consultant to the stars and telling people what's what and telling people to shake trees and, and make yeah. choices and have a mission, vision, value? I, I always wanted to be a cartoonist, actually. That was, yeah? that was the thing I really, I was, uh, yeah, I never had the, the patience. So I could always draw an element, but never had the patience to draw an entire book. So that was, that was very young me. Um, let me see. For, you can tell by my accent, I'm not from around here. Uh, I'm a New Zealander. Uh, who's lived in Australia, Hong Kong, New Jersey, and now Austin, Texas. Back in time, I always liked language and words. That was, that was my thing. And it was annoying. Um, my dad was a radio DJ, and he was, a, he was an actor, and I think wow. instilled in me a, a passion for language. Uh, so I studied English literature at college because, you know, at, back in the day, they paid you to go to college, uh, and I didn't know what else I wanted to do. Right. Uh, I remember... I was, there, there was an advertising agencies back in the days. This is New Zealand in the 80s, which was actually a hotbed for global advertising. Uh, and there was an advertising agency competition where you could enter this thing, you get taught different skills. You do billboards and um, radio, and TV, and that sort of thing at different shops. Uh, and if you won the competition, you would get an internship. Again, this is in the mm -hmm. day where it was very, very hard to get into these things. Um, I didn't win. I came second. Uh, but that, that was something where I thought, you know what, if I can make money with language and words, this is kind of cool. Um, I got into radio copy and mm. I, um, was a radio copywriter for years, um, uh, which is something actually my grandmother was a former copywriter too. And my dad. So it's something. Should we get on like, air like your dad? Uh, I would, I do voiceover work for radio. I was always the, the sort of, I don't know, squeaky young voice, I think was how I was cast. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I did. I did. Uh, I did some of my own voice work and stuff. But mainly, um, I was writing like 10, 10 scripts a day. It was it was real retail radio. Um, and then I yeah, I got into uh, a, a radio production studio. I got into PR as a long form copywriter. So I was writing. You know those annoying brochures you used to get with your credit card statement saying, "Hey, yeah. here's a fun thing you can do with your credit card." That was me. Um, <laughs> I, I wrote those things, and I, I wrote books for companies, all sorts of stuff. And then got into strategy. 
and that's that's really where I got into the more I guess more integrated side of comms. So it was words and um, language support strategy, and yeah, that was me. And then I got into tech PR and got into digital PR as it was then. And I I, I figure by having done that for twenty x years, uh, I've kind of earned my role today. <laughs> it's funny. It's like I look back and go, if I'd said up twenty years ago, I am a brand consultant. Um, people would have laughed at you. What do you know, you 23-year-old fool? Um, but now I, I've done enough of this stuff so that I, I can give advice based on reason, logic, experience, yeah. as opposed to, uh, we didn't have Google back then, but as opposed to um, making stuff up. So yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. Uh, that, that's kind of the journey. And I, I've fallen, uh, not fallen back in life with words because I've always been, language has always been the, the through line in writing. But I find myself doing a lot more writing these days and I'm really enjoying it. And that, that's, I don't know, that's your tagline. It's your value proposition. It's your, at the heart of your business, your values. I mean, this sort of writing, I really enjoy. Websites, websites are great. I mean, they're, it's kind of mechanical when you're writing 20 pages of, of various web copy. But again, each one of those pages, I'm trying to make it say something that makes sense to an audience and not just, oh, there's a horrible phrase, SEO copy. Oh, I, I rebel against that. There you go. I hate that stuff because it's just, it's, it's designed to be read by machines and okay. When the machines start reading the machines, that that's Terminator time. Yeah. That's when we, yeah. You know, that's, that's, right. that's, that's when they become self-aware and we need to, we need to go hide in our bunkers. But uh, yeah, I just, I hate that stuff. And I'll, you'll see jobs that say, Hey, I want some SEO copy and I will, <laughs> I will not entertain that. You write because it's the right thing to do and it's inter interesting or entertaining or informative or whatever the goal is for that audience. You, d you don't write because you want the machine to scan it appropriately. That's yeah. insane. But yeah. yeah, that's my story. It's all about words and language. Words and language. Man, tell me, this is the question I've been sort of sitting on um, mm -hmm. since we talked about what, when not to do the branding. Mm -hmm. When is it time to work with you? Mm. When is the sweet spot for a company where it's okay. like, let's get this guy in here? Okay. I'd say for a, a midsize or a company or an established company, it's when you want to rebrand. So that's a company that is pivoting to a um, new product line, new service, new positioning. Uh, I worked with a large IT services company and they were going from, they had a 54 year old company and they were going from being a traditional supplier of I don't know, software hardware services to being a more of a digital transformation company. And they mm. wanted to, they wanted to be something and sound like something and represent, I guess, where, where, where they want, where they were increasingly being, being asked to play. And that was a fascinating job because it was, it was kind of building on this very well established foundation, but looking at language that better represented where they were and also where they aspired to be. So that, that was a very interesting job. Uh, the other side, I, I tend to work with either three or four year old startups who have probably done that thing that I talked about before. They built a fundamental website. They've got a logo. They've probably got um, a decent ARR and that sort of thing. But they're, they're realizing now is the time to, and I, this is a crass, but grow up as a company. We need to start, we're starting to get to a point where um, this, this idea has become a real company. And we need, to, we need to appeal. And oftentimes, it's to a point you made earlier, it's oftentimes it's realizing, especially if it's a SaaS company, that the company, the, the customers they're winning are lower value customers. And they're spending as much time or probably more time servicing and supporting these low value customers as the higher value. So the, the question to me is, how do we position ourselves so we're more appealing to a higher value customer base? And that's a perfect time for me because you've already figured out what the problem is. You know, <laughs> you, you, and not, no, it's not a marketing problem. It's, it's, a, um, it's a service problem or it's a, a product problem. Um, so, okay, we've, we know what we, we, we are. We know what we don't want to be. So now you've got to help us achieve this this next step and i think that's a really good time to have a conversation um simply because you you've figured a lot of those the problems out uh and like i said i don't want to be the person who sells you a, a brand proposition and sells you messaging and builds your website uh only for that not to be something that represents again, a, a, who you are and what you what you uh it doesn't represent success for you it just represents right. a i don't know it's like a billboard you know, I, I want to be the person who helps you go to that next stage and next step. I love that. Love that. My gears are, are churning up, up here. At one point I'm thinking, oh, I'm, I'm still in that product market fit or, oh, I'm still doing this other thing. But then I do know there's two paths I can go. And 
one is sort of traditional, but this other one seems like those higher value customers, right? The ones that aren't, aren't super needy, aren't churny, aren't all the things, but man, are we positioned for those (laughs) and not for the, the other ones who are like, yeah, here's the check. No, the other, the other ones, I mean, don't get me wrong. The other ones are great, but they shouldn't, they should be in terms of support. I mean, this is out out of marketing, but in terms of support, they should be supported by the knowledge base and they should be supported by the online community. And, you know, you shouldn't be, they honestly you should put down a credit card and that should be completely automated. We, yeah. we want to grow. You grow on the back of customers who do require consultancy and services uh, and, and I know more seats and all those sorts of good things. So, yeah, I, I think that is an ideal place for, for me to play uh, just because it's, it's it, like I said, you, you figured out what's not working and you have a really clear idea, clear idea of what is working. Hell yeah. Hell Yeah. Now I have that one question Mm -mm. that really helps me get to know you, which is a bit of a hypothetical if you're ready for it, Mm -hmm. because I may or may not have a time machine here in New Hampshire. Let's say you come visit, right? Mm -hmm. You you know, too much warm weather in Austin. You want to come to New Hampshire and get some snow where, you know, find that fleece that you haven't used in years. Uh, Come up here. We use the time machine, get some lobster, Mm -hmm. some beer, and Mm -hmm. the time machine goes back in time. To mm-hmm. a few days after after school, after graduation, mm-hmm. you get to meet yourself. Yep. What kind of advice, what kind of things would you tell younger you? You know what? I would, uh, t- having stepped out of the time machine, I would tell younger me to go back to school and learn data analytics. And again, most people in marketing or PR in particular have run a mile from mathematics of any way, shape or form because that was not where they wanted to play. But I would tell that young person, go back and learn it, because quite frankly, and I tell the same thing to older me, quite frankly, because that <laughs> is that is a skill set that is invaluable in every single profession and industry in the world. Wow. And whether you're a marketer or whether you're in sales or whether you're, um, I don't know, you're, you're on your lobster boat and you're, you're wanting to be the captain of that boat, knowledge of data and how to apply it to a business is absolutely critical. And the sooner you have a grounding in that, the better. So I would have said to that person, go back and learn that stuff and then be an even more powerful wordsmith as I guess I wanted to be because you can do data to validate your decision and inform the advice that you give. So that's, that's what I would have said to that young person. He would have laughed at me and told me to go away. I was going to say, would he listen to you? (laughs) Oh, you know, he... Having just completed the degree, it probably would have been, oh, not more school. Not I, ended more. Up tra- I ended up traveling the world. I, I spent a year traveling through Europe and North America and living in a van and all those fun things. But maybe I should have gone back to school after that. But uh, yeah, I think, I think he would have listened to bald me. I think um, bald me may have, may have been persuaded. I, I might have used clever words or something, but you know. <laughs> I know, that, but that, that's a data analytics, seriously. That, that's the thing that I, I tell kids today if they want advice about their profession or just make sure you've got that because it, it, is, it is the thing that is driving change at pace uh, and you are going to be a better insert profession, occupation here with that knowledge. Have you found a good place to learn any of that? Uh, I do most of my stuff through YouTube, weirdly. Okay. Uh, any I just, channels I just, you recommend? Oh, there's a, um, there's a guy called, uh, what was he? Data analyst, uh, Alex, the analyst, Alex, the analyst. I got to know Alex through, um, one of my former clients, which was a business intelligence company. And Alex is, he's a, he's a data analyst. I think he's in Dallas and he's uh, very, very down to earth and just really good advice about data, data management. Uh, for, I mean, that, that's a good sort of superficial broad learning. When I'm needed to go deep into a topic, I was learning SQL, the programming language, a while ago. Uh, that was just various websites that I'd, I'd would give me sort of <laughs> SQL for idiots courses and that sort of thing, which helped me understand. Uh, but yeah, I, I find anything. I was saying to my my kids yesterday, anything. If if you have a problem, it's inevitable that someone else in the world has had that problem and solved it online. Uh, and so there is a wealth of information that just helps helps guide. So yeah. Definitely, I'd go to YouTube first. Cool. I just subscribed, man. He looks like a, a guy I could learn something or, or two from. Oh, he's, a, he's a great guy. Yeah. Again, and he speaks like a human being, which is always useful. For, oh, I love that. For people in data, which helps immensely. I mean, it's, it's so true, right? I mean, and, and it's, it's, I think it's people like this that I could really learn from because when I mm-hmm. did 
I did computer science and they, they, they took me so deep into math land that I was just like, mm. I, I don't want to be doing this right now. Just mm -hmm. because I like programming websites doesn't mean I want to do abstract algebra, you know? And, mm. and so it's almost like they, they took me book style and, and I sort of missed the point, which is, man, this could be really cool to actually understand statistics and not just have mm. to check the box, yeah. but to actually know what it means. And so I, I feel like you where I, I could probably fill in quite a bit of gaps there. I, you know, and I, I think it's, it's not surprising, but I look at Google Analytics, for example, the, the, what is it, GA4 that's just come out? Yeah, um, the new one. I learned, I learned the old one years ago. The new it's one and the way it teaches you is, is just, it's brilliant, you know, and, really? and the way you gather insights by just typing in questions in natural language. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not surprising. Well, actually, you know, it's not surprising, but it's so refreshing where you can ask it a question. And I don't need to learn the ins and outs and, and I, don't, I, I don't need to know how the sausage is made, you know, <laughs> and that, that's something that, I, again, I've learned over the years. I've always said, especially with technology clients, I don't need to know how to write the code or build the laptop or the phone or, you know, I, I, as, a, as a marketer, I need to know how, what's important to your audience and I need to help you work on language that, that is compelling and interesting, um, but I don't need to be able to build the thing. Uh, and, right. and I've, I've always been I, technically oriented, but I, I know my limitations, but when it comes yeah. to learning, you know, again, anything that's going to make it easier for me to use the tool, I'm all about it. And, and GA4 is an example of that. It's a very, very smart piece of, of, I was going to say industrial design, but it's certainly software design. Uh, yeah. and yeah, and again, it, it's just, as I say, it, it, it removes barriers. You know, it should, you shouldn't need a PhD to be able to run analytics on your website. Uh, it should be something that is intuitive. It's the same with uh, the whole no-code, low-code movement, where it's it's about building apps. Uh, and just not having the ability to code shouldn't limit you from building something that's compelling and solves a problem. And we're almost at a point, I think, in terms of technology where, where I don't know, anybody can do it. And I, I find that so refreshing. But yeah, I mean, again, back, back to the core point, learn online, keep investing in, in data in particular. Uh, and keep finding ways to, to use that to inform decisions because, uh, and not to say there's no room for creativity because there absolutely is, but, but use those two things in combination. And I think that's what leads to successful marketing. Man, you are an absolute badass. I said at the beginning, you are, you truly are. This has been so much fun talking to you. Where can people connect with you? Uh, LinkedIn. In, you can find me uh that's yep. probably the the easiest way to find me i have websites and that sort of thing but i'd start with linkedin you know i, I find of all the social networks that's the one that still maintains some degree of I don't know, real connection in spite of all the people trying to sell me ways to 10x my new business revenue blah 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 but yeah linkedin yeah. is a good place we'll connect on there um, we'll take that conversation to the real world through zoom uh, i'd love to meet up in person as well but uh but yeah i mean those, those are the best ways to find me uh, but yeah, I, I tend to spend most of my time online and in places like that. Love it. I actually have a trip coming up to Austin. We'll have to talk about after Absolutely. we get off here. See if we can't Absolutely. meet up, make it happen. Let's make do the party happen. It's um, going to happen. You bring the lobster. I'll get the beer. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> see if they have any fresh ones at Logan. Uh, <laughs> hop on the plane. Just boil some water. Have it ready. <laughs> I'll start it boiling right now. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Dude, this has been so good. Thank you so much for coming on here. I, I really feel like I, you know, over 300 episodes and sometimes you, you can be like, man, it, it, things are repeating and no, not at all in this episode, not at all in this conversation. I probably already need to get you back in here because we haven't talked about van life and there's so many other things we can talk about, about actually the brand once it is time to do the rebrand and how to do that. So maybe we'll, mm -hmm. we'll get you back in here. Um, Anytime. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. So thank you again for coming on here. Thanks. Thanks for teaching me, sharing what feels like your soul and your passion for, for brand and companies and all this stuff. Anytime. Like I said, my friend really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's catch up a beer and lobster when you're in town. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. And for those listening, if you want beer and lobster too in Austin, <laughs> all you have to do is <laughs> like, and subscribe to this show, but no, seriously, share this show. If you've learned anything and I know you have, cause I literally have run out of paper, right? I've got like front and back here, run out of paper, learning things. If you have to share this with someone else, 
get this into someone else's hands. That's thought leadership. That's how you help other people out. Maybe they're about to do that website redesign and maybe there's something better they should be prioritizing in that inbox, not just that Slack message. So uh, man, good stuff. Jeremy, thank you again, sir. Thank you so much. All right, everyone. It's been another crazy cool episode of the Hardcore Marketing Show. We'll see you all next time.